eternal, righteous, and invisible Father in heaven. Thank you, dear Lord, for giving us the privilege to be among the living today. Lord, we pray that our lives will be taken into your care and consecrated to you, that all our talents, our abilities, all of it will be used to bring glory to your name. To that end, we ask that as we fellowship with you now, that you would be with us in the person of your Holy Spirit, help us to rightly divide the word of truth, give us grace not to be hearers only, but also to us of your word. Put your words in my mouth, dear Lord, that as I speak, you will give me the right words to say that will help everyone who is listening to the blessing of our souls. In Jesus' name I've prayed. Amen. That I may know him. November 11. Count the cost. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark chapter 8 verse 35 to 37. Disease and death are in our world. And how little we know when our individual probation shall end. How many, if now called to render up their accounts, would do it with grief, regret, and remorse that their God-given probationary time was so fully employed in self-serving? The eternal interests of the soul have been fearfully neglected for unimportant affairs. The mind is kept busy, just as Satan designs it shall be, with selfish interests and nothing of any consequence and time may be passing into eternity without a fitting up for heaven at all. What can be compared with the loss of a human soul? It is a question which every soul must determine for himself, whether to gain the treasures of eternal life or to lose all because of his neglect to make God and his righteousness his first and only business. Jesus the world's redeemer looks with grief upon the large number of those who profess to be Christians who are not serving him but themselves. They scarcely think of eternal realities. Notwithstanding, he calls their attention to the rich reward awaiting the faithful who will serve him with their undivided affections. He brings eternal realities within the range of their vision. He bids them to count the cost now of being an obedient and faithful follower of Christ and says, Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Matthew chapter 6 verse 24. He would have every individual sense his responsibility to so use his precious time here in this world that it will be fruitful daily in good works. This is the only worthy aim of every living mortal to employ his God-given faculties with endless results in view. Amen. The title of our devotion for today is Count the Cost. In previous devotions, there has been a call from the Lord telling us that we should walk the narrow way. And the concept of walking the narrow way is also the same thing as the Lord telling us come out of Babylon, which means we should have no friendship with the world because that would mean enmity against God. And enmity against God eventually leads to destruction. In order for us to understand these concepts, the Lord makes it very plain to us. Separation from the world, coming out of Babylon, walking the narrow way is the same thing as keeping the commandments of God. For this is what raises that wall of separation between us and the world. This is what makes us walk that narrow way. And God has told us not to be ashamed because when we do this, we are making ourselves God's peculiar treasure. But yet, we are going to look odd, strange, and singular to the rest of this world. We will be mocked, ridiculed, persecuted because of it. But no one is supposed to run away from the commandments of God on this account. As opposed to walking the narrow way, there is the broad way where all sinful pleasures are permitted and we can go in with all our plans, ambitions, and sins. There are no restrictions. Anything is permitted. Those who walk in this way think that they are enjoying themselves. And it is such people as these that our key text for today applies to. Mark 8 verse 35 to 37. 
For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall find it. For what shall it profit a man, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Amen. Here is contained one of the deepest questions the mind can ever contemplate and meditate upon. And I am inviting everyone who is listening now to meditate on that question. What shall it profit you to gain the whole world and lose your soul? What is the price of your soul? What is the cost? How much can one buy it from you? Does your soul have a price? How much can I drop? What money, what, what possessions can you be given so that you can give up your soul? It's a question whose answer can cause those who are entrenched in worldliness to wake up from their sleepy indifference. If we will only consider that in giving up our souls to worldly amusements, we are gaining the world at the expense of our souls, we will make straight paths for our feet. The Lord Jesus, as we read, lifts up his voice to break the spell of infatuation upon human minds and asks the momentous question, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I want us to take our minds to work now. Imagine with me a people who are in a ballroom. Imagine them there. You've seen videos of that before, perhaps. If you are in this world, you've seen such things. The music videos. They are dancing, making merry, drinking alcohol, involved in all kinds of worldly pleasures. Also imagine with me that brother or sister who, have, who has felt that they need to falsify some document in order for them to rise higher in the echelon of their of their career path and then they tell lies they cheat they do all these things they're chasing the worldly ambition while negate, negating all the commandments of god committing adultery involved in pornography imagine with me that brother or sister who's involved in sexual sin masturbation eating and drinking things that are abominable and all the time while they are doing this there's no sense of repentance there are people who struggle. I'm not, I'm not referring to that, but I'm referring to those who are doing these things with both hands, who are going headlong in these things, thinking for themselves that they have an ambition and something that they want to gain in this world. They are involved in all kinds of partying, jesting, having a swell time. And while all this is going on, just imagine it, just like the uninvited hand at Belshazzar's feast, a startling voice is heard asking the question to these people, what shall it profit you? To do all these things you have done, that is gaining the whole world, and at the end, you lose your soul. Or, how much can your soul be bought for? That is what we are supposed to count the cost of. There are two things we have to count the cost of that we are going to be looking at. The cost of the soul and the cost of eternal life. When I say the cost of the soul, I'm referring to this question Jesus asked. The cost of the soul in comparison to gaining the whole world. And what it will cost us, on the other hand, to gain eternal life. Let's talk about the cost of self-serving, first of all, which is gaining the whole world. That's because that's what it is. We are serving self. What is the cost of self-serving? Eternal loss. If you understand the concept of service, to serve someone means that you obey the person and do the person's bidding and his whims. That's what the Lord means when he says, serve me. When you, when you see the Lord talking about serving him, attached to that, the keeping of his commandments. That is how we serve God. We don't serve him with our sins, but we serve him in righteousness by obedience to his law. But when we serve self, we are not listening to God. We are listening to ourselves. We are doing what we want, not what God wants. Whatever our plans, ambitions, that's what we want to do, not what God wants to do. But the Bible tells us about ourselves, that we are carnal, that there is none of us that is good. So if you are serving self, you are serving yourself, doing what you want to do, what are you doing? You are doing the beatings of someone that is not good. Because the Bible says there's none good but who? God. You are not good. I am not good. So if I'm listening to myself, I'm certainly going to get myself at loggerheads with God. I will not do what God wants me to do. Counting the cost of self-serving. What is the cost of it? Eternal loss. It costs the life of the person who chooses to serve himself. And who is the one that is causing us to do this? It is Satan. Because he is the one asking for the price of our souls. Satan is coming to you and asking you, how much are you willing to sell your soul for? I, he's gathering souls. He's a merchant man that deals in getting souls. That's what Satan is doing. A merchant man that buys souls. And he comes to different people asking them how much. He's in a shop that for some people, they are, some people are like supermarkets. They are like malls. There's already a price tag for their soul. 
they don't Satan does not need to come and barter with them and start asking, okay, I want to buy this amount. They are not going to sell except it is this amount. And for those ones, Satan can get them very easily. Is that how much? I'll give it to you. Whereas there are others who he comes to bargain with them. How much is your soul? And they tell him this and he tells them, no, I want to give it to you for this amount. And for them, they will think about it. And uh, for some, Satan actually does get the price for people's souls. And there are others who, they have no price tag on their soul. They are not selling that's exactly what we should be like Christian and faithful who when they were in the city of Vanity Fair they did not buy anything from there and were not willing to spend their money on anything that wasn't Vanity Fair this is what is going on when we are going against God's commandment Satan is coming to do to us what he did to Jesus he first of all tempted, tempted him two times and none of them worked and then he showed Jesus all the kingdoms of this world and said to him how much is your soul I want to buy it. Give, I will give you all I own. Everything in this earth belongs to me. I will give you. Just give me your soul. How did our Lord Jesus respond? He refused. But I would like to read this account from Desire of Ages, page 129, paragraph 2 and downward. And as I read, you will also see the problem with humanity and the difference between us and Jesus. We know Jesus didn't sell his soul. But too many today are selling their souls for cheap. I'm reading now. It says, Placing Jesus upon a high mountain, Satan caused the kingdoms of the world in all their glory to pass in a panoramic view before him. The sunlight lay on temple cities, marble palaces, fertile fields, and fruit-laden vineyards. The traces of evil were hidden. The eye of Jesus, take note of that point, let me not go past it quickly. The traces of evil were hidden, and this is what the devil does to people today. When he is presenting them the flattering prospects of getting the world at the expense of keeping God's commandments, he hides the evil in what he is giving to them. So take note of that. Continuing the reading, it says, The eyes of Jesus, so lately greeted by gloom and desolation, now gazed upon a scene of unsurpassed loveliness and prosperity. Then the tempter's voice was heard. All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. You see, this is the same thing Satan does to us today. The unsurpassed loveliness of the world is shown to us on the TV. Our teachers tell us in school what you can be if you are employed in this company or that company. So, when people hear you'll be paid this amount if you're working in the in offshore, or if you have this particular job in the government, oh the world has been presented to them and then others are lured into the music industry or the movie industry and they are lured by these by these things and Satan tells them these are the glories of the world have you heard of so and so please have you traveled to this place have you traveled to that place there's this and there's that vanity fair that's just basically it and the people are attracted and then they ask how can I get it and then he starts to say this is what you must do but along the way you must sell your soul in the sense that you must break God's commandments that's the cost of it. I'll continue the reading. It says, Christ's mission could be fulfilled only through suffering. Now, this is where we need to understand. What is your mission? Do you have a mission? What we read in our devotion tells us that the problem with many is that they have a mission and ambition to serve self. And when this is defined as your mission, you will certainly not do what Jesus did. So we need to have a mission like Jesus. And we read in the last paragraph of our devotion what our mission should be. God would have every individual sense his responsibility to so use his precious time, that is your life, in this world, daily employed in fruitful good works. This is the only worthy aim, mission, goal of every living mortal. To employ his God-given faculties with endless results in view. Christ had a mission. What is your mission? Do you have one? Christ's mission was to save the world from sin. How then can he bow to Satan? Sin so that he can gain the whole world. This is the problem, the mission. Christ's mission could be fulfilled only through suffering. Before him was a life of sorrow, hardship and conflict and an ignominious death. Amen. Christian, seek not yet repose. Cast thy dreams of ease away. Thou art in the midst of fools. Watch and pray. Jesus knew he was not having any dream of ease. Too many of us have dreams of ease. And that's why the devil is able to buy our souls from us. Continuing about Christ, he says he must bear the sins of the whole world. He must endure separation from his father's love. Now, 
the tempter offered to yield up the power he had usurped. Christ might deliver himself from the dreadful future by acknowledging the supremacy of Satan. Let me pause that and say something. Do you know that Satan has so fashioned and programmed many people's minds that our mission is to avoid suffering? Christianity today, the prosperity gospel that has pervaded it, is a gospel that has a mission to bring an end to suffering in this earth. And that is the end going end game. It is not to bring an end to sin, but to bring an end to poverty and suffering. Therefore, anything that should be that can be done to do that will be done, even if it means to sin against God. We must change our mission. It must be to bring an end to sin in our lives and not suffering. Christ did not say, I must bring an end to suffering in my life. I must not suffer. I must not suffer. He knew he would suffer. So when suffering came, he embraced it. Continuing the reading, it says, But Christ might deliver himself from the dreadful future by acknowledging the supremacy of Satan. But to do this was to yield the victory in the great controversy. It was in seeking to exalt himself above the Son of God that Satan had sinned in heaven. Should he prevail now, it would be the triumph of rebellion. When Satan declared to Christ, The kingdom and glory of the world are delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. He stated what was true only in part, and he declared it to serve his own purpose of deception. Satan's dominion was that wrested from Adam. But Adam was the vicegerent of the Creator. His was not an independent rule. The earth is God's, and he has committed all things to his son. Adam was to reign subject to Christ. When Adam betrayed his sovereignty into Satan's hands, Christ still remained the rightful king. Thus, the Lord had said to King Nebuchadnezzar, The Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Daniel 4 verse 17 Satan can exercise his usurped authority only as God permits. Amen. When the tempter offered to Christ the kingdom and glory of the world, he was proposing that Christ should yield up the real kingship of the world and hold dominion subject to Satan. This was the same dominion upon which the hopes of the Jews were set, and the hopes of many today are also set upon that kind of dominion. Continuing the reading, it says, They desire the kingdom of this world. If Christ had consented to offer them such a kingdom, they would gladly have received it. So it many today. And I pray that is not you and me. Going on it says, But the curse of sin with all its woe rested upon it. Christ declared to the tempter, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Amen. This was how Christ overcame. Now, how about us? Continuing the reading it says, By the one who had revolted in heaven, the kingdoms of this world were offered Christ to buy his homage to the principles of evil. But he would not be bought. He had come to establish a kingdom of righteousness, and he would not abandon his purpose. How about you? What is your mission? For Jesus, it was to establish a kingdom of righteousness. Let us adopt Jesus' mission. Drop your own. Remember, we've learned to have no will of our own. The will of God is to establish righteousness on the earth. We pray that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we've seen that the will of God is his law, righteousness, to establish that. Drop your own purpose. Adopt the purpose of God to establish righteousness in your life and in the world. And do not abandon it like Jesus. He says he had come to establish a kingdom of righteousness and he would not abandon his purpose. With the same temptation, Satan approaches men and here he has better success than with Christ. Sadly so. It's sad. To men, he offers the kingdom of this world on condition that they will acknowledge his supremacy. He requires that they sacrifice integrity, disregard conscience, indulge selfishness. Christ bids them seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But Satan walks by their side and says, Whatever may be true in regard to life eternal, in other words, I'm not doubting anything that's been said about life eternal, but I'm telling you this. In order to make a success in this world, you must serve me. I hold your welfare in my hands. I can give you riches, pleasures, honor, and happiness. Hearken to my counsel. Do not allow yourselves to be carried away with whimsical notions of honesty and self-sacrifice. I will prepare the way before you. Thus, multitudes are deceived. This is a dark saying here from Satan. Satan is saying, I know, I've heard about eternal life and all of that. And possibly it is true. But I tell you this, as far as you are in this world, you can't do without me. You want to make money, you want to make ends meet, you must serve me. But is it true? It is not true. 
Like we have seen, Jesus is still the king of this world and he gives it to whomsoever he wills. So what Satan stated is, or what he even tells us today, that you can you must cheat, you must lie, you must put your hands in sin before you can make ends meet. Let me put it that way. The world will say before you can succeed. But that's not success. But I'll just say it exactly as it is, before you can make ends meet. It is not true. There are many who have not bowed down to Satan and they have made ends meet. And the Lord has promised that those who serve him will never beg for bread. He will never leave them to beg for bread. Except, except you are not serving the Lord. Except you are attracted by the things that the devil is using to allure you. Except you want to serve self. Except you want to live a life of self-aggrandizement. Then certainly you must serve Satan to do that. That is the truth. That is the truth. You must serve him. If your if your goal in life is to be rich, you will fall into diverse temptations. You certainly will serve Satan. There's no two ways about it. You must. There's only one way. If your goal in life is I want to be a millionaire, I want to be rich, I want to be famous, I want to be popular. If that's your aim in life, please, there you have it. You must sell your soul to the devil. But if your aim is to establish righteousness, to get victory over sin, and that's your purpose, God will still allow you to make ends meet. And you will not need to serve the devil to do that. Let's continue the reading now. It says, Thus multitudes are deceived. They consent to live for the service of self. And Satan is satisfied. While he allures them with the hope of worldly dominion, he gains dominion over the soul. I told you, what is Satan? He's a merchant man that is buying souls. But people are, are selling. That's why he can buy. If there were no sellers, the Satan would not be able to buy any soul. Continuing, he says, But he offers that which is not his to bestow and which is soon to be wrested from him. In return, he beguiles them of their title to the inheritance of the sons of God. Amen. Let me stop here for a while. You know what's going on here? Satan is buying souls with money that does not even belong to him. It happens that people sell lands that don't belong to them, and others buy it not knowing that the person who sold it to them is not the owner. So after they have given the money to the person who sold it to them, they think the land is theirs, but the real owner comes later and says, with the documents, this is my land. That is what is happening today. Satan says, I will give you the world, world that he does not own, and says, give me your soul. Many think that they can get the world and give Satan their soul. But after getting the world, later they will realize that that world and everything he he gave to them does not even belong to Satan and he cannot preserve it for them. The true owner is God and he is coming to rule over this world that the devil is using to buy people's souls. What a cheat he is, a deceiver, and many are falling for his scam. Continuing from Desire of Ages, page 130, paragraph 3 and 4, now it says, Satan had questioned whether Jesus was the Son of God. In his summary dismissal, he had proof that he could not gain say. Divinity flashed through suffering humanity. Satan had no power to resist the command. Wreathing with humiliation and rage, he was forced to withdraw from the presence of the world's Redeemer. Christ's victory was as complete as had been the failure of Adam so we may resist temptation and force satan to depart from us jesus gained the victory through submission and faith in god and by the apostle he says to us submit yourselves therefore to god resist the devil and he will flee from you draw nigh to god and he will draw nigh to you james 4 verse 7 and 8. we cannot save ourselves from the tempter's power he has conquered humanity and when we try to stand in our own strength we shall become a prey to his devices but the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Proverbs 18 verse 10. Satan trembles and flees before the weakest soul who finds refuge in that mighty name. End of quote. Amen. What was the price tag placed on the soul of Jesus? Nobody can place the price tag. It is only you who can. And for Jesus, he placed no price tag on his soul. He was not selling. This is our example. We are not to be engage in the selling of our souls. Instead, we are to use our souls to prepare for eternal life, improve on that life that God has given you through good works, through the walking of the narrow way, so that you can get life eternal. We should now be using our lives for the only thing it is valuable for, and that is to secure eternal life. Life has just one use, and any other use makes it useless. Life is wasted when used to gratify selfish ambitions and indulge in sinful pleasures. But life will not be said to have been a waste if used to secure a place in the kingdom of God and upgraded to the next level of immortality and eternality. Ministry of Healing, page 397, paragraph 2 and 3 says, Life is mysterious and sacred. It is the manifestation of God himself. 
the source of all life. Precious are its opportunities and earnestly should they be improved. Once lost, they are gone forever. Before us, God places eternity with its solemn realities and gives us a grasp on immortal, imperishable themes. He presents valuable and noble truth that we may advance in a safe and sure path. In pursuit of an object worthy of the earnest engagement of all our capabilities. Amen. And what is that object? Righteousness. Victory over sin which leads to eternal life. That is the only object that life is good for. Count the cost, the Lord says, of using your life for something else other than securing eternal life. What is the cost? Eternal loss. It's a scam. But then, we are also told to count the cost of what it will take to get eternal life. Luke 14, reading from verse 25 says, And there went great multitudes with him, that's with Jesus. And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me, and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counted the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it mock, begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulted whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that commit against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Amen. So Jesus calls us to count the cost also of eternal life. Because you don't want to make a fool of yourself. He's trying to make us understand that to get eternal life is no child's play. When he says count the cost, it doesn't mean that all of us have individual costs. No. It is one cost for everybody. It costs everything. That's the cost of eternal life. What is the cost individually or specifically in following the commandments of God? If I choose not to tell lies, what will I do? What will be the cost for me? You may lose that job. You may be in poverty. If you choose to dress the way you're supposed to, you may be mocked, you may be ridiculed. It may cost us many things that we don't want. But what do, I, what do we gain? We gain life eternal. But we must understand what is going to cost us also on this earth, so that when we get into it, it will not be a surprise to us. For dress, for example, reading from Health Reformer August 1, 1868, paragraph 2, it says, We have counted the cost of appearing singular in the eyes of those who feel compelled to bow to fashion, and we decide that in the end it will pay to try to do right. Though for the present we may appear odd in the eyes of those who will sacrifice convenience, comfort, and health at the altar of fashion. Amen. This is the way we should think. Though it may cost me some ridicule and scorn and mockery, I've counted the cost and I see that it will pay for me to obey God's commandments. That's what we should be saying. Have we counted the cost of eating differently from the world? It's the same thing. Count the cost. It may cost you mockery, ridicule, and all, but your health will be better. So after counting the cost, what will you do? Do the right thing. The cost of gaining eternal life, the cost of being a disciple of Jesus, is that we would have to pass through humiliation, self-denial, and also suffering. But the end of it is great blessing, so much that your suffering will not be remembered. But count the cost nevertheless, and then decide, like John and James, and say, I am able to drink of the cup that Christ drink and to be baptized with the baptism of Jesus. Why? Because we have seen the end of the story. Reading from our high calling, page 189, paragraph 5, it says, Many hardly know as yet what self-denial is, or what it is to sacrifice for the truth's sake. But none will enter heaven but by the same path of humiliation, self-sacrifice, and cross-bearing that the Savior trod. Only those who are willing to sacrifice all for eternal life will have it. But it will be worth suffering for was crucifying self and sacrificing every idol for, the far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory will outweigh every earthly treasure and eclipse every earthly attraction. End of quote. Amen. Amen. Also reading from Testimonies, volume 4, page 259, paragraph 2, it says, 
Only in the name of the mighty conqueror can you gain the victory. So after counting the cost, you find that the strength is not in yourself. You don't count the cost and say, I am able, like in the sense that I have the power in myself. When John and James said, when Jesus asked them whether they are able to drink of his cup and be baptized of his baptism, which is the baptism of suffering and persecution, they said, we are able. They were not saying so in the sense that they trusted in themselves. We too should understand that having counted the cost, we should say, I am able, but not in my strength, but in the strength of the mighty conqueror. So reading, it says, Testimonies Volume 4, page 259, paragraph 2. Only in the name of the mighty conqueror can you gain the victory. In conversation with others, dwell upon the mercy, goodness, and love of God instead of upon his strict judgment and justice. Cling fast to his promises. You can do nothing in your own strength, but in the strength of Jesus you can do all things. If you are in Christ and Christ is in you, you will be transformed, renewed, and sanctified. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Be sure that Christ is in you, that your heart is broken and submissive and humble. God will accept God will accept only the humble and contrite. Heaven is worth a lifelong persevering effort. Yes, it is worth everything. God will help you in your efforts if you strive only in Him. Amen. Amen. So heaven will help everyone who will understand that there is a striving to do. And if we strive in Christ, we will receive the help from Him. But let us conclude by dwelling upon, by reminding ourselves that indeed the eternal weight of glory outweighs every suffering and every pain that we may experience because we choose to have the purpose and mission of Jesus Christ as ours on this earth to establish righteousness on the earth. While we are doing that, yes, it will cost us everything, but we will get a million times more than what we lose. What then? Jesus says that he that loses his life, which means his time, his efforts, his strength, his possessions, his money, he that loses it while serving the Lord, uses those things to serve the Lord, will save it. So, are you really losing anything? What does it cost us to get eternal life? In the end, it costs us nothing. Because we gave something small for something bigger. So, when you count the cost, what is the cost now? Nothing. Presently, it might look like it's costing us something. But when the transaction has been done completely, and we get back what we paid for, you will see that the bargain was a good one. It was indeed a bargain that we gained more than this whole world. We gained a life that measures with the life of God. Just because we spent our time, used our money, our talents, our possessions, all for God. Count the cost and you'll see that heaven is cheap. Let us pray. Dear Lord in heaven, please etch on our minds the impression and understanding that the cost of heaven, whatever it is, the cost of eternal life, whatever it is, the cost of righteousness, whatever it is for every one of us individually, it is cheap. O oh Lord, please awaken us from our sleepy indifference and help us on no account to sell our souls to the deceiver, but give us grace that our lives may be used to the glory of your name. Whatever temptations we may be facing now, that's causing us to want to sell our souls. Give us grace to overcome, O Lord. Open our eyes and help us to make the right decisions. There are some who have sold their souls and they are realizing it. Or some have not even realized. Open their eyes. For those who are realizing it, help them to make the change and get back their soul and give the devil back that which he gave to them. That they may recover themselves and secure eternal life. Thank you, dear Father. Please help our weaknesses and give us grace to overcome us. In Jesus' name I've prayed. Amen. This message was brought to you by the Angel with a Strong Voice, a ministry dedicated to preparing people to stand true to God and be ready for His imminent return. For more information and free online resources, please visit www.tawas.org. That is www.tawasv.org or contact info at tawas.org.